thanks for coming out. It's a uh, uh, pretty crummy weather, but thanks for being here. And I want to really thank Jay and the ERI for putting on this session. Um, I've been a member, as Jay said, 25 years of ERI, and as a seismologist, it's been really, really important to be interacting with the engineering community. So it's sort of nice to be able to give a little bit back in, in terms of making these present, uh, presentations for, for this particular uh, series. Um, when you try to put together something like learning from earthquakes for very, very significant earthquakes, basically the process is going through a lot of different slides and, and uh, reports and trying to gather as much information as possible. So I need to give credit to a number of different people who uh, I've wiped their slides, borrowed slides and talked to them or used their, their reports and sort of scaled the font on these according to the number of uh, slides I swiped. So um, my presentation is my own, but if you have any uh, interest in the slides, you can see uh, most of the time I have whose slide it is. And uh, if there's anything controversial, you can pick somebody up here to, to, to blame on the content. Um, we were just in San Francisco, so I had this slide up for yesterday. Um, obviously, uh, this has been one, uh, this is the fourth of a series of talks. And so um, we've, uh, we've covered four cities and we're, we're going to be wrapping up today on the, the fall EERI tour. Uh, I also showed a slide of you know, the good news in San Francisco and the bad news in the East. And even as we're going back and looking at past lessons, there's disasters happening in front of us. And one of the things about the process that we have here today is that you really need to stare at what you can uh, learn from past earthquakes. And it takes a lot, of, a lot of effort to go back in our busy lives and, and learn these lessons from past earthquakes. Obviously, we'll learn a lot from what happens in the East. So, you know, the way I'll do this is go through these, these major events that, that Jay outlined, and um, they're really lessons to be learned because they're such rich data sets. And so that's, that's going to be the focus here, is to follow the data. And therefore, I will be starting with Tohoku and spending most of the time with the Japanese earthquakes because, um, there's, there's, again, as Jay mentioned, they're so rich in data. Uh, if we have some time this afternoon, we can ask questions about any other events that have happened recently or, or what's going on around the world, uh, but this is the main focus. And then I'll kind of come back with lessons learned from each of these earthquakes. The goal and the theme throughout is going to be to follow the data, like I said, and then try to understand what was expected from these earthquakes, what was you know, just the way we, we thought things would be, and what was really different than what we thought would, things would be. And I'll kind of focus on the, uh, the seismological setting, the tectonic setting, give you an overview, and then try to focus in on the ground motion issues, which what, what controls the ground motions in each case? Is it the seismic source? Is it the path? Is it side effects? And then we'll look at some other key features about these particular earthquakes. So if we look at uh, the shape maps uh, for both Tohoku and the Chilean event, these are huge pieces of real estate that were shaken particularly hard. Uh, these are roughly the same scale, so you can compare the areas in Chile and, and uh, Japan that were affected. And if we bring up uh, shape maps on the same scale for the New Zealand events. They look like little postage stamps, but uh, keep in mind, you know, and this will be part of the theme here, is the proximity to the population is really what's going to be driving losses in, in, in a number of different earthquakes, and it's certainly the case here with the Christchurch and the Darfield earthquake uh, a little further from, from uh, Christchurch. One of the most important things about the the Chilean and the Japanese earthquake is that they did provide data for the largest earthquakes that we've uh, recorded. Um, these are really, really critical data sets. And the two data sets from Tohoku and Chile are filling in a gap that we really had at the largest magnitude. If we do ground motion prediction equations and we do that based empirically on observations, this fills in a, a gap in our, our knowledge base that's pretty important. And obviously, when you have the density of stations like Japan, you fill the gap in very, very quickly with one particular earthquake. But the magnitude 8.8 uh, uh, Mali event is also important because it's in a different tectonic setting. Even though it's a subduction zone, we want to get a variety of different events to, to see how things change from place to place. So um, how many of you know what Gramlich prediction equations are or look at plots like this with, with attenuation? Are you familiar with uh, these kinds of plots? The, uh, you know, these are kind of key in the, in the discussion here because we can compare what we would predict ahead of time with what we see uh, empirically and what we record. And I'll show you for, the, for these events, these kinds of plots, and we'll, we'll try to put them into perspective and understand all of the components of this. For the Tohoku earthquake, if you look at acceleration on the, on the y-axis as a function of distance from the fault, 
you realize that the closest day is about 50 kilometers away from the fault. That's because the, the fault is dipping deep beneath uh, Honshu and it's uh, quite deep at the coastline, about 50 or 60 kilometers deep. So that's the closest data that we have, but it's an incredibly dense data set. If you look at the, the Maui earthquake, we're getting a little closer to the, to the fault, about 30 to 35 kilometers, because this interface beneath Chile is a little bit shallower than it is between, beneath northern Japan. So the data density is not nearly as great as we have for Japan, but we're getting a little closer to the source. And if you look at the, the Christchurch event, where the city of Christchurch was right above the cause of the fault, then we're looking at uh, source distances of just a few kilometers. So we're, we're, again, very close to the source here in comparison to the other events, which are, as subduction events, further from the interface than, than, uh, than we typically see for crustal earth. <coughs> and sort of the goal here is to understand all these differences and all the elements of the ground motions here as we, as we go forward. Um, just as a kind of side note, we did have on Saturday night a fairly significant earthquake uh, not too far from this uh, particular piece of real estate here. Uh, in fact, a number of people in the northernmost part of the state did feel this magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake along the uh, Queen Charlotte Fault. Uh, very complicated. It's, it's actually a, a transform boundary, but it has some compression, and so this was a thrust fault uh, along that boundary, magnitude 7.7 fairly sparsely populated, and so uh, I don't know of any damage from this particular earthquake, but it was widely felt through the, the last panhandle in Canada and all the way down to the Washington border. I don't know, did anyone feel that here? Anyone in the room? Okay, so it was really just about out of range here. And um, we made a shape map for that, and that uh, uh, represents the fact that there was, there was no reports of, of shaking on, on the Queen Charlotte Islands, but the, the shaking probably was fairly intense based on what we'd estimate from the ground motion prediction equations. So um, I'm now at NEIC, the National Earthquake Information Center in Golden. I was in the Pasadena area for about 15 years. Uh, in, in the aftermath of a significant earthquake in NEIC, we are putting together as much information as possible very quickly. Uh, we are trying to put out all these products at the same time while we're trying to bring in data, trying to talk to the media. It gets to be pretty complicated. Um, so it really is nice to actually go back and try to read all these reports and try to integrate all this information and understand as much as we can about these earthquakes because during the time of the earthquakes, it's, it's, it's fairly chaotic. And uh, you know, the goal that we have there is to try to produce as many useful products as possible in near real time. And uh, the shake map's one of them. In the case of the Tohoku earthquake, we were unable to get the ground motions for about three or four days because their, uh, their source of power at the, at the hub in, at, uh, in Tsukuba that collects the data was out. Um, I think they've remedied that situation since, but they did make the data available in, few, in a few days. Some big, very important points about this earthquake. Um, first of all, uh, it is, like I said, and, and Jay mentioned, it's the largest earthquake for which we have really dense recorded ground motions. The rupture length was about 400 kilometers uh, by 200 kilometers wide down dip. It's the largest fault slip we've ever experienced or observed. Over 50 kilometers, sorry, over 50 meters of slip. 50 meters of slip is enormous. And I don't think that prior to this earthquake that many people in the seismological community would have said we would experience a 50 meter slip earthquake in our lives. I, I think it's, it was much more than we had anticipated. So that's sort of a, a, an interesting lesson. Uh, the tsunami heights were up to about 39 meters and uh, routinely over 5 to 15 meters, which is really pretty enormous for, for the swath of real estate that experienced that. But you'll notice that 39 meters isn't all that different in scale than the 50 meters. And you tend to see for tsunamigenic earthquakes that the maximum tsunami height is proportional to the maximum slip on the fault. Uh, it's, it's not a direct relationship, but it's, it correlates pretty well, and you'll see that with Chile. So being able to image the slip on the fault is probably a good thing if you're trying to understand what potential the tsunami is. Uh, so that, that's an important aspect to, to recognize. Uh, there was a magnitude 7.34 shock. Uh, two days before the earthquake, as we'll see, there's magnitude 7.7, 7.9 aftershocks. Those are significant earthquakes in their own right, and over 100 magnitude 6 aftershocks. And if you think of what a magnitude 6, you know, what kind of response we have in the United States when we have a magnitude 6 earthquake, you can imagine 100 aftershocks and magnitude 6 happening in the months following 
uh, this magnitude 9 main shot. As we mentioned, the ground motion recordings were really quite substantial, over 1,200 recordings that had both surface and downhole measurements. The downhole measurements at about 100 meters are really critical in understanding what part of the energy came from the source and what part of the energy is being uh, amplified or deamplified in the near surface material. So that's a very important collection of data set. And I'll show you that there's, uh, there's quite a few other stations in addition to those 1,200. Um, this was the second time that JMA intensity reached seven. That's approximately uh, mod a modified Macaulay intensity nine, and, and uh, so that's a significant uh, observation as well. And uh, as Jay mentioned, intensities of seven and eight were experienced over huge portions of uh, northern Honshu, and, and so mi millions experienced this shaking, and, and, and many experienced several minutes of shaking, which is quite, un quite unimaginable if you've ever been through an earthquake. The other thing we try to do is kind of put some context in terms of plate tectonics and the, uh, the source of the earthquake when we have a significant earthquake. This is the Japan Trench, the Pacific Plate diving beneath um, Japan. One of my colleagues and I have put together a model of the slab interfaces, the interfaces between the plates of subduction zones around the world. And these are contours of the depth of the interface. And for Japan, the interface uh, at the trench, obviously here's where the interface is at zero depth, and then it goes to 20, 40, 60 kilometers. At the coastline, the interface is about 60 kilometers deep. So that's the closest that you can be to that interface in terms of the source of shaking. And as you go further west, the interface goes well into the mantle, down to hundreds of kilometers. And we'll see, important to note, that while the interface here is 60 kilometers, in the south, southern part of Japan, the interface starts at 20 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 60 kilometers. So it's much, much shallower in the south than it is um, in, in northern Japan. And that'll come back to, to have some implications. So let's look in a little closer. At the time of the earthquake, like I said, we didn't have the ground motions available to us, but we did have the capacity to estimate the shaking with the shake map system. We came up with a, a crude estimate of the fault dimensions, which also is important in terms of measure, estimating ground motions. You need to know how far you are from the fault. So that's pretty key to get that um, together and then make an estimate of shaking. From the shake map, we now compute loss estimates in near real time with the pager system. And we put out estimates that had um, hundreds of fatalities and tens of billions of losses from shaking alone. Uh, we're not considering the tsunami impact in the pager system, just shaking. And so uh, what we now know from this particular earthquake is that there were hundreds of shaking fatalities. There probably are more, but they would be hard to separate from the tsunami casualties that were along the coast. Uh, and, and so, and in fact, there, the shaking losses alone would probably be in the tens of billions of dollars. So I think, I think the model that came out initially was, was quite useful. Uh, although the tsunami disaster that followed was clearly the, the main story as time went on. As I mentioned, you know, a number of different products that we try to produce as quickly as possible. One of them is a slip map, a ma map of this offset on the fault on the interface in this case between the subducting plate and the overriding plate. And Gavin Hayes in our office is producing rapid finite fault models with slip distribution. In this case, um, slip going up to 30 to 40 meters. When Gavin first came to me with this model, because I want to bring that into the shake map system, and he said, I'm looking at 30 or 40 meters of slip, he was very <laughs> tentative. He did not believe that his model could be right. And you know, with further data and further analysis, it turned out to be over 50 meters of slip. But his caution was pretty warranted because we just had not seen that kind of slip before, even though we just recently had the Chilean earthquake and the Sumatra earthquake. 50 meters, 30 or 40 meters seems like way too much slip, but it turned out to be the case. So that's the pattern of slip that we got initially. It didn't quite reach the trench, and with more careful analysis and more detailed analysis and more data, we were able to see that the slip actually does reach out to the trench. And that's pretty key because um, if you look at a cross section going through uh, this particular part right here, and you look at the trench where the interface is at zero, and then deeps, uh, and dives beneath Japan and beneath the coast right here, um, where exactly the slip happens along this interface is going to drive a number of different things. One, the shaking that you experience on land, and two, how shallow the slip is here is going to drive how much of a tsunami you generate. So this is a very important thing to try to image in near real time, and we're getting better and better at this even though it's a, it's a complicated uh, and, and um, always a, a hard, hard to resolve problem.
and uh, you know, just in a cartoon form, and sorry, this is flipped around 180 degrees from the direction of, of subduction in Japan, but you know, in a cartoon form, you think of the, the plates being locked and, uh, and, and compressed, and then when that uh, ver gets un unlocked during an earthquake, you get an uplift that generates uplift of the ocean and a, and a significant tsunami. If you want to understand the problem in detail, um, you, you could spend a little time staring at these particular plots, because this is really what's going on, but it takes a little time to, to dive into. Very quickly, in a nutshell, if the slip is very deep, then you can have, um, at the coastline, you can have coastal uh, subsidence, and you'll have a little bit of uplift in the oceanic area and generate a tsunami. As the slip gets shallower, uh, different things can happen at the coastline depending exactly where the slip is. You can have the co coastline go down, you can have the coastline go up, depends on exactly where the slip is. But then you'll generate more uplift of the ocean bottom and more tsunami. If the slip is particularly shallow, closer to the trench, then one, you're uplifting the ocean more because you're closer to the ocean bottom, and you're also uplifting deeper water, and that tends to both contribute towards a, a, a much larger tsunami than you would have if you had only shallow slip. As we'll see for Tohoku, we had each of these components of slip, and, and therefore we had effects uh, on the coast as well as um, uh, enormous tsunami generation. Uh, the other thing that, that's very important in Japan uh, and in terms of the context of this earthquake is that there, there was a pretty significant history of earthquakes along this interface. So there were about 13 magnitude 7 earthquakes along this, this particular subduction zone over the past 400 years historically and five magnitude 8 earthquakes. And based on that evidence, they put together a, a picture of ruptures that had segments that looked about 50 to 100 kilometers long each. And they estimated magnitude 7.5 magnitude 8 to magnitude 8.2 earthquakes in their hazard map and in their planning scenarios for, for tsunamis. And that, um, that was a shortcoming in the sense that they didn't ever connect these together as a possible rupture for an enormous earthquake. And in fact, what did happen was a rupture of many of those segments at once, reaching a, a length of 400 kilometers. And so, again, the, the failure to connect those seg segments because that hadn't happened in a 400 year history uh, was, was a bit of a failure, but going back in time, they may have seen such, such uh, larger ruptures. And in fact, that certainly was the case. Um, and this has only been really recently been uh, looked into, it was prior to this earthquake, but there was, there was a bit of a, uh, writing on the wall here, and they were just trying to put it together recently. And, and a recent study in 2008 showed that um, the 869 earthquake, which had also very significant, very high tsunami heights, uh, was best explained with a model offshore in the kind of intermediate uh, depth location of about a magnitude 8.4. So they're starting to see that historically, as you go back a thousand years or two thousand years, you're starting to see larger events than you've seen in the last 400 years. And so I think that was, a, the story was becoming clear. And, and they were also putting in offshore measurements to try to understand the strain accumulation. Uh, and so over time, I think they would have recognized this potential. What's really interesting to me in terms of this, this earthquake, you know, any, any major earthquake, these are all magnitude 9 earthquakes of recent years. This is the Chilean earthquake, the largest earthquake on record, magnitude 9.5, about a thousand kilometer length, a couple hundred kilometers wide. The 64 Alaska, magnitude 9.2, about 800 kilometer length. Um, also extremely wide. The Sumatra earthquake was a narrower in terms of its width, but it had a length of 1,200, maybe 1,300 kilometers. And then the Chilean earthquake that we just had, magnitude 8.8, .8, was, was about a 600 kilometer length. What's interesting to me about the Tohoku earthquake is that it, it actually was quite a bit shorter than you would expect for a magnitude 9 earthquake. And uh, it, it just shows you the variability of the dimensions of the rupture and how hard it would be to say, given a particular fault length, what magnitude earthquake we're going to have. And the reason it, it's, it's particularly complicated is that, in this case, the area was smaller than expected for a magnitude 9, given what we've seen in the past. And the reason was that the slip was greater. Okay, so you can, you can trade off for given magnitude. Magnitude is just the, the area of the, of the fault that ruptures times the slip over that area. You can have a smaller area if you have more slip, and you can have a larger area and smaller slip. In this case, we had um, the former, where we have a smaller dimension and a much larger slip. This has got some pretty serious ramifications. 
One is that if you can have a magnitude 9 earthquake in a 400 kilometer segment of subduction zone, you can probably have a magnitude 9 earthquake in a lot more places than we originally would have anticipated. That's one story. The other one is if you can have 50 meters of slip on a fault, um, you can have incredible tsunami generation uh, in a place that you might not have had uh, recognized before that potential before uh, because the slips have, a ranges, have ranges that we might not have anticipated in the past. Now, how do we know that we have 50 meters of slip off, offshore and underneath the, the ocean? Well, uh, the Japanese, again, uh, have collected enormous and incredible data sets, not only seismic but geodetic. These are GPS monuments that were displaced uh, all over northern Japan at the coastline over five meters to the southeast, the direction that the uh, overriding plate would move. And it, it diminishes as you go across the, uh, the island, and the strains actually contributed, if we think, to another rupture that I'll show you. Uh, and then the coastline subsided by about a meter. Okay, so if you've got five meters of offset, 50, 60 kilometers above the fault interface, you know you're going to have to have a lot more slip at the interface. So that's, that's just one quick story. But, but the Japanese are, um, are incredibly resourceful and had the foresight to put out ocean bottom GPS monuments prior to this earthquake, and they measured 24 meters of offset at one point. Now, they only had a few instruments. These are extremely difficult to maintain and to monitor, but they had 24 meters of offset. And this, again, is not on the interface. It's above the interface. So uh, it'd be unlikely that they captured the most slip possible. And you know that the slip on the interface is going to be greater than the slip that's measured at, at the ocean bottom. So at the very minimum, we have 24 meters of slip on the interface. But what they modeled after looking at the on-land uh, geodetic data and the offshore geodetic data, is that it'd be somewhere between 50 and 60 meters of slip was probably the maximum slip. Very close to the trench, that's very shallow, and therefore would have uplifted the ocean bottom and created a, 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 the kinds of uh, tsunami heights that we, that we observed. So this, um, this offshore measurement is really critical for this particular earthquake, but as you gather information about the strain accumulation, you can also see which portions of the interface are accumulating strain. And with enough of these measurements, they hope to be able to recognize which areas are freely slipping and which areas are, are not. Now, the, the other important story, and again, it's driven by the types of data sets that are collected for this earthquake. For, for the um, Tohoku earthquake, there are a lot of different models of the slip that over time became quite detailed and quite informative. And they all converge on, on a very, very straightforward story that's, that's now something that we can resolve that we just couldn't do for past earthquakes. And the story is like this. If you look at the strong motion data, and the strong motion data is the data that's collected along the, uh, the coast and in inland and Honshu, you recognize areas that are little patches that the Japanese call strong motion generation areas, SMGAs, that are the sources of particular pulses of energy on the seismograms. And they map out those, those pulses to sources on the fault that radiated those ground motions at high frequencies. And what we look at when we look at these different data sets is in strong motion, we look at short period energy, one to five seconds perhaps. Teleseismic, the recordings recorded around the globe at seismograms, uh, typically longer period, mid period, 10 seconds to maybe a minute. And then uh, tsunami data and geodetic data measure the permanent offset. What's the total slip? And so that's a very, very long period view of the world. And these different views of the world show you that the high frequencies came from the deep part of the fault in very specific areas. The tsunami was generated by slip along the closest portion of the interface to the trench, and it was a lot of slip, but it didn't generate a lot of high frequency energy. It wasn't really seen by the strong motion data on land. And then if you look at the global data set, you see that there's some slip down at depth. There's not a lot of slip happening here where the high frequencies were generated. But you do have some slip, not as much as you had shallower. But the teleseismic model sort of joins these two together. And you see that you had very, very high slip that didn't radiate, radiate a lot of high frequencies shallow, and the opposite happening uh, down at depth. If you look at the ground motions that were recorded on land, um, the Japanese have mapped out these pulses and slip to particular locations on the fault. And depending on who does this, you know, the exact locations of these move around, but you really get this sort of similar picture, which is discrete points of the fault generating um, high frequencies. And uh, it's really quite, a, quite a apparent when you look at the seismograms that they, are, they have different sources 
and not just a, an entire ruptured plane. So when you put it all together, you get a model where you have slip happening, you know, shallow and slow, and then you have high frequency radiations happening deep, all on one enormous interface of about 400 kilometers long. And this is best explained, and it's, it's, it's uh, sorry, this is cut off at the bottom here. This is uh, Thorne Lay, some paper in science. It's very well explained if you start looking at the nature of the interface itself. And these kinds of models help us understand the behavior of the interface. What Thorne uh, suggests going on is that the areas in gray here are areas of the fault that's locked, and that when they rupture, they rupture very quickly. They radiate a high frequency seismic energy. It's the kind of uh, standard earthquake that we think of interface earthquakes to have. Occasionally, the shallowest material, which is much weaker, can store strain, and sometimes it slips in great uh, earthquakes that are slow and generate large tsunamis but don't radiate a lot of energy uh, seismically. And so that would be called a tsunami earthquake. There's a portion that's in between those two areas that's, that's conditionally stable. It can slip freely in some cases. It can be locked. It can rupture. If the deeper slip is large enough, it'll rupture right through that part and be uh, seismically radiating. And then in the case of Tohoku earthquake, not only did it rupture through this conditionally stable area, but it ruptured into the slow part and generated this enormous displacement. So this is one of these earthquakes where the entire uh, seismogenic width ruptured in one particular earthquake. And so we've seen each of these types of behaviors separately, and in this case we're seeing it all in one particular rupture. Uh, so in a sense, when you look at the ground motion data, you say, well, you know, did we miss the fact that a magnitude 9 earthquake would give us much greater shaking? To some degree, that's not quite the case because it wasn't the entire fault that generated the, long, the uh, seismic shaking on land. It was parts of the fault that looked more or less like seven at magnitude seven and a half to eight earthquakes. So in that sense, um, maybe that, that um, segmentation of the, of the boundary wasn't all that bad because the ground motions more or less look like sub-events that are magnitude eight earthquakes. They just happen to rupture all at the same time. But from a tsunami perspective, it's a huge oversight because the displacements were so much larger. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the hazard map for Japan as of 2008, and you compare it to the, uh, the shaking that was re recorded on, uh, on Honshu, and here I'm showing Japanese JMA intensity, but I put on top of the uh, JMA scale the modified Macaulay scale, so when you get to intensity 7 and JMA intensity, it's roughly equivalent to our magnitude 9, uh, sorry, intensity 9. So this was the map of Japan with stronger shaking to the south and not as strong shaking to the north. But of course, there was some significant shaking uh, you know, estimated along here, and that was certainly realized, although there were areas that were shaken harder than you would have estimated from the, from the seismic hazard map. But you know, there was some, quite a bit of criticism of this map. But in fact, a lot of the reason that the southern part of the of the island has stronger estimated shaking in a return period of, of 30 years is that, as I mentioned earlier, the interface is a lot shallower there, so you're closer to the subduction zone. And the southern portion did already experience in this 400 year time period magnitude eight and a half earthquakes. So that's what drove the nature of this hazard map and having a longer history would have probably changed that story quite a bit. And so, as I mentioned, you know, when we know where the interface is, you're about 60 kilometers from the, from the fault here, and in southern Japan, you're 20 or 40 kilometers from it, and that, that does drive up the hazard because you're closer to the source. Okay, so now, you know, Jay mentioned the, the nature of the, the strong motion data and what would be recorded here in the U.S. for a particular uh, large earthquake. Um, in, in California and, and in Seattle and Portland, I think we do pretty well in terms of station coverage, but uh, take a look at what the Japanese have. So this is KNET for, uh, this is one of the research networks for uh, the, island of, uh, the islands of Japan. The other research data are another uh, 674 stations, all with downhole instruments. So these are both recorded at the surface and downhole, very, very important. Uh, but wait, there's more. Um, Port and uh, Airport Research Institute has uh, instrumented the coastal areas very carefully. Um, JMA also has a number of stations for real-time reporting of intensities. And every prefecture in Japan has an intensity meter. Intensity meter pops up the Japanese JMA intensity with a single number, but it's driven by a ground motion acceleration recording. 
So every prefecture has a straw motion instrument in it, okay? And, uh, and yet it's not over. This is the uh, uh, Ministry of Land uh, Infrastructure, uh, Transportation and Tourism, and they have another network. This isn't even it, there's more. I don't have them on here, but the utilities themselves record in, uh, their own facilities. They have a lot of instruments. And so I count over 6,000 uh, recordings from this particular uh, series of networks, and, and there's more than that in Japan. So that's, that's rather impressive. And what you get out, of course, is a very detailed view of, of the uh, earthquake in terms of its shape and distribution. Here we're looking at um, the uh, peak acceleration uh, recorded from the main shock, and uh, this particular slide is uh, from Maduro Kawasan, who's uh, provided a number of slides to me, and he points out that there were over uh, 34 recordings that were over 1G from this earthquake. There are over 200 recordings that are over half a G, uh, so that's some pretty impressive uh, accelerations. But accelerations, as I'll show you, are not the real story in this particular earthquake. They're a bit misleading. Um, if you look at the peak velocity in comparison to the peak acceleration, and the peak velocity looks at a longer period view of the, of the shaking, the peak velocities are in the range of maybe 40 to 80 centimeters per second. And, and those are hefty velocities. But for the Northridge earthquake, we had 170 centimeters per second. In the Kobe earthquake, about 170 centimeters per second. As you get very close to the fault, you can get much larger velocities. And so I think the peak velocities are much more consistent with the uh, limited damage from shaking along the coast and along the, the island of Honshu for this particular earthquake. And the key there is that they are pretty distant from the source and so the velocity pulses are, are not as prominent as they are for crustal earthquakes. But the accelerations, we, we need to explain these accelerations, uh, some accelerations up to 3G. Uh, if you just look at the rock sites and you look at peak acceleration on the left and peak velocity on the right, you'll see that um, they're, they're not all that impressive, actually, for, for this magnitude earthquake. 20 to 30 percent G in rock sites, and 30 to 40 centimeters per second uh, in velocity. So clearly there's something going on beyond what's happening at the source in terms of generating these ground motions. And we can examine that by looking a little bit more closely at particular stations. Um, one thing we know is if we compare the downhole and the uphole recordings at particular sites, we'll be able to tell whether this energy is coming from the source or it's being uh, amplified on the way up uh, through the soil column. This is a rock site, and the blue component is at the surface, and the green component is downhole. And um, if you look at the basic physics of the problem, if you have a very, uh, if you look at very long periods, uh, the amplitude of the two should be the same. It shouldn't matter if you're close to the surface or, or buried uh, at very long periods. But as you get to higher frequencies, theoretically and mathematically, we know that we should see a factor of two amplification just from a half space, a, a free surface uh, from shaking. And we see that. We see a factor of two on average uh, amplification of the downhole uh, with, uh, compared to what's measured at the surface. So pretty well behaved. And in fact, there's not a lot of uh, amplification going on in terms of certain frequencies being amplified more than others as you look at the spectra of these recordings on rock. And so there's not a lot happening on rock. It's doing just what we expect it to do. It amplifies by a factor of two at high frequencies when you get to the surface. Uh, and, and pretty simple story. The story is not so simple when you look at soil sites. Here's a soil site that's close to 3G on the, on the horizontal component. Uh, near a rock site that's a third of a G, uh, near a soil site that's 2G. And these are, you know, relatively close to each other, all very comparable distances to the source, which is down at 60 kilometers beneath them. And so much, much, much of the difference here, or most of the difference here, is simply the fact of the material properties that they're on. So if we look at those three stations, and the rock station is the one that is in blue, compared to the soil stations, you can see a lot going on here in terms of amplification. Uh, if you look at, well, first of all, duration here is pretty impressive. You know, this is, this is a large earthquake. We're getting two minutes of shaking. Uh, but the amplification is quite pronounced at the soil sites. Um, and if you zoom in on this little window here, you can see the rock station, one of the soil stations here, and then the 3G soil station here. And you can see this, um, this behavior here looks like the, the soil is failing and yielding. It's probably cyclic mobility. We'll hear a little bit more about that from Ross. But what's really pretty obvious when you look at the amplification 
the rock site is not much going on, but the red soil site, um, clearly there's an amplification at a couple of hertz, very, very prominent uh, peak. And then the green soil site with 3G has a very large amplification at, at several hertz, uh, up to about eight hertz. And so this is really driven by the shallow soil material properties. And uh, you know, it's not saying a lot about the source, it's saying a lot about the site effects. And if you look at some of the other culprits, some of the other accelerations that are really well above the predicted es estimates, then these are mostly explained by similar very shallow soil column uh, amplification and resonance over rock uh, that, that tends to dominate a lot of the stations in Japan. And so uh, Maduro Kawa has gone through and looked at a number of these stations and you see similar types of observations where the sharp pulses in the acceleration records are indicating uh, yielding in some kind of cyclic mobility in the, in the shallow soil column. Uh, that's, that's really being uh, contributing to these high accelerations. And, and in fact, if you look at the acceleration versus distance and you just switch from acceleration to velocity, you see that uh, all of these really large outliers in soil sites become less so as you go to peak velocity. So you can see the highest frequencies are the ones being amplified here, and they're amplified by, by uh, factors of 5 to 10 in some cases. And lastly, in terms of the, this earthquake, um, you know, Tokyo was shaken pretty hard. Um, there was a number of recordings in Tokyo. It's only around 15% G, but the durations are really rather impressive. So if you're in a large structure there, you'd really feel it. This is one of the records in, to uh, in Tokyo area. Again, 16% G is the maximum recording here. You can see the durations. But here's a case where if you look at velocity, it's really revealing. Um, Shaking was up to six minutes in this particular location. So that's a pretty impressive uh, experience that yeah, I don't think people will forget. Uh, and if you're in a high rise, that, that's going to really uh, give you some, some motion. Um, just lastly, you know, there's a lot of talk about earthquake early warning. Um, it's sort of inevitable that we apply this technology. Uh, the Japanese have done so uh, very successfully in, in, in some cases, and yet there were some mixed. Uh, mixed outcomes in this particular earthquake. It did stop a number of uh, bullet trains, Shinkansen trains. It was very useful for the notice for notifying uh, residents along the coast. But in fact, uh, the initial warning went out based on a location that was accurate, but with a magnitude that was very low compared to the ultimate magnitude. It was about a magnitude 7.9. So the estimate of shaking from that magnitude 7.9 was a lot smaller, uh, a lot lower than what actually occurred. And their estimates of shaking in, in JMA intensity are shown on the right. What actually observed was on the left. And the main reason, uh, the main reasons that the shaking was underpredicted is that indeed a magnitude nine earthquake has a huge dimension to it. And if you're above that fault, you're going to have much stronger shaking than than you would if you predicted the shaking from a distance at the epicenter. Uh, they didn't. And when you do the warning, the rupture hasn't even reached the rest of the fault. So you have you know kind of a catch-22 there. You can't be really early and still know the size of the earthquake. That's a, that's a, a fundamental uh, challenge in early warning. And they also did not have the capacity to go above magnitude 8 in terms of the system, early warning system. So they would never have predicted the shaking levels that were recorded. And in fact, what that resulted in is not warning residents in the Tokyo area. This was the area that was warned. Everyone in this area received warnings well ahead of the shaking, the strong shaking from the S-waves. So that was very successful. Again, you know, electronic systems and the bullet trains were stopped. Very successful. But, um, you know, from, a, from a, uh, an operational standpoint, they did not warn the Tokyo area where 25 million people live and experienced very strong shaking because they estimated the shaking to be intensity 4 minus, which is below the threshold for the alert going out to that region. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was very successful in the, in the um, near source area, um, but it was not broadcast to Tokyo, and it really got stuck in these hundreds of magnitude 6 aftershocks. There were just too many things going on and too many messages going out to be, uh, to be useful in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. That's sort of a, 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 a situation where there's a lot of effort being placed and a lot of funds being placed into early warning in Japan, and in this particular case, uh, it was quite a challenge for even that system. We can come talk about that this afternoon if you'd like to. In fact, 
Um, this might be a really good time to take any questions about Tohoku. Uh, we can kind of stand up and stretch if you'd like to, too. It, it's, uh, a lot of the talk was about Tohoku, and we can, we can see if there are any questions. Go ahead. Time history is your show. Um, can you comment on why a lot of them have two yeah. Most events attached, and the Tokyo ones were just one. Yeah, so that's the, you know, if you, if you look at one record, it's hard to say what's going on. If you look at all the records along the coast, you start to see these patterns, and that's what's done when you look at what the sources are for those particular pulses of energy. And so if you, if you look up and down the coast, you'll see that there are three or four areas on the fault that are radiating. And depending on where you are with respect to those, they will all separate out in time or they'll all merge in time. And so if you're in the direction where they're all rupturing in sequence, the rupture happens roughly at the shear velocity, and the shear velocity, the shear energy from those, pulp, those uh, asperities or slip patches will all arrive at one place at the same time. So, so Tokyo looks kind of compressed, and other areas as you go further up the coast see these patches further apart. And it's that separation or lack of separation allows you to find out where they're coming from. So um, durations are always going to be long, but uh, because the whole the whole fault area is giving off energy, but the largest amplitudes are going to be dominated by these asperities. And again, exactly what the geometry is with respect to your particular location is going to depend on. You know, it's going to dictate whether these things separate out or come together. Or is that typical for Japan, and could it be expected for here? I, I think it is pretty typical behavior of, of a, a large earthquake, where you know you have enormous area that slips, but parts of it radiate basically higher frequencies because they're either um, the velocity of the rupture is changing quickly, or the, the the amount of slip or the rise time is changing very quickly. How quickly the slip takes place, and that was, that's what controls high frequencies. And so you see this big rupture, but on top of it, you have the print of these kind of radiators that, that dominate the, the ground motions. If you have just a magnitude just, just a magnitude six earthquake, you tend to have a very simple pulse, um, you know, because you don't have that separation of, of slip over such a large area. Good question. I I don't understand um, what you're using for distance for the ground motion prediction equation for an aerial source with where are you measuring from? <laughs> That's a great question. The, okay, so in the way we empirically model ground motions, we always measure distance to the source if it's known. If it's just a magnitude 5 earthquake and it's a, pretty much a point, you measure it to the hypocenter. For magnitude 6 or larger, magnitude 9 earthquake, you have a huge fault plane, and you measure typically to the fault surface, and you're getting at a very subtle issue that needs to be considered very uh, in a, little, a lot more detail than what we currently do. We typically use a rectangle when we measure distance, and it's the closest distance to that rectangle. But as I said, the slip distribution is very heterogeneous, and if we wanted to more carefully predict ground motions, we would want to more carefully measure where the energy on a particular seismogram is coming from. But we don't typically, and this is a data issue, we can't go back in time and get all of these slip maps the way we can do that for these, these modern earthquakes. So we make the approximation that historic earthquakes are a rectangle, we measure to that rectangle, and in a forward calculation, we use that distance, and it's fault distance. And one of the important keys there is for future earthquakes, we don't know the distribution of slip, so using a rectangle is a way to approximate that, um, not knowing where the slip is going to be and how those variations happen. So it's sort of a, a limitation in the state of the art, it's also a limitation of what we'll know about future earthquakes that, that's reflected there. It's a great question. Okay. We'll have time this afternoon for some other more general questions or, or detailed questions, but let's go on to Chile then. Um, okay, the, the kind of summary information here, and again, there's a shake map on the right of peak acceleration. Uh, this was also, uh, again, a longer earthquake than the Tohoku earthquake, even though the magnitude was smaller, it was about 530 to maybe 600 kilometers in length, depending exactly where you draw the line and the amount of slip, uh, about 150 kilometers width. The maximum slip was about 10 to 14 meters, and the uh, tsunami run-ups were uh, around 3 to 8 meters. So again, there's a correspondence between the maximum displacement on the fault, which was mostly in this shallow area, but not as close to the trench as for Japan. And there's a correlation between that maximum slip and that maximum tsunami height. Uh, 
This is the second largest earthquake, as I mentioned, that we have slow motion recordings. In this case, we only have 31 recordings, but that's pretty good considering it's a, um, a very important earthquake. Uh, but it doesn't it pales compared to what was recorded in Japan. So we don't have as much to say about this earthquake from a ground motion perspective, and we don't have the downhole measurements that make, make life so easy in terms of understanding the site response. And um, there are some areas that are really uh, attributed to site effects in terms of the damage. Some of those we recorded, and some of those were just in areas that we've seen historical shaking comparable in terms of its concentration in, in, in soft soil areas. Uh, the, again, the shake map produced on the left was done without any strong motion data. We did that very quickly by dis establishing roughly this fault dimensions. The slip distribution from Davin Hayes' finite fault model is here, and we use that at approximate surface to, to de determine the distance from which we predict the shaking on, on the uh, uh, surface. This is slightly different than what we saw in Tohoku. We have mostly shallow slip, or intermediate slip, and not as much really shallow slip along the trench. So the slip here is a lot lower, 10 meters on, 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 or so, uh, compared to 50 meters of slip, and it's slightly deeper than it is um, for the Tohoku earthquake. So we'll see some interesting coastal features here. And if you look at the contours of that interface model, these red lines, we had 20, 40, and 60 kilometers. And the coast is a little, somewhere around 40 kilometers above the interface. So this is a little bit different than what we saw with Japan, where we were about 60 kilometers from the interface. That, that distribution of slip can be converted into an uplift model. You can estimate what the, the ocean bottom is doing and what, uh, what the on land uh, uplift and down dropping would be. Again, it's not all that simple because depending on where it is down dip, you can have uplift or you can have down dropping. And if that slip varies along the strike of the fault, the pattern can be pretty complicated as you see here. But you can estimate it pretty well and it's very well done and, and, and um, with the geodetic monuments, you can, you can make measurements and, and turn that into a model of slip. And some areas you see that the, the coast is going down, some areas the coast is going up, uh, and some areas significantly so. And keep in mind, if you have dropped down a meter like in Japan or in this case in the northern part of, of Chile, that down dropping is happening before the tsunami arrives. And so you have an additional factor as you have with tides on top of the tsunami height that's generated, whether your coast has already subsided or not, uh, will also affect the, the ultimate outcome of the, of the tsunami as it hits shore. So some areas had very little uh, change vertically, and some areas were significantly uplifted. Um, and, and that variation just depends on where the slip is, both along strike and down there. Now, the, the um, Chileans also have a very rich history of earthquakes along this area. And like the Japanese, have engineered appropriately, given what they've seen in the past. We'll hear a lot more about that this afternoon. But in terms of the seismic history, this earthquake happened in an area where we might have expected a, a significant earthquake, and indeed it was. Uh, there was a large rupture comparable in 1835 that was really nicely described by Charles Darwin on his voyage of, of the Beagle. He did some quite remarkable uh, observations. He measured the coastal uplift. He went inland and realized that there were sh uh, shells as he marched inland and up the up into the highlands and was starting to put this geological story together and quite, quite a scientist. And that, that, um, that description is really nice. And you can see that there's about 70, 70, sorry, 70 millimeters of slip uh, occurring across this interface. This is the Nazca plate subducting between, beneath the South American plate. That's about seven meters per year. So every hundred years or so, you could get a magnitude, you get a seven meters of slip. Uh, and that's pretty much what's happening along the interface here. We're having uh, kind of 100-year repeat times. This has not slipped since 1835, and we had about 10 to 14 meters of slip. So these some things are kind of predictable and consistent with the, the long-term pattern, but one would be hard-pressed to exactly nail down how much slip and where and when it's going to occur. But that story was pretty interesting. By the way, Darwin also pointed to the fact that there were a number of eruptions that occurred following this, this subduction zone event, and um, that's something we've seen in the past, and I'll come back to that for the Tohoku earthquake in a second. Now this was really widely felt. Um, we didn't have the ground motions in real time for this particular earthquake. We did have the digi-field system in place, 
This earthquake was felt throughout South America, and in Chile, there was a number of good observations from the DigiField system in terms of uh, intensity that were reported quite quickly. That, along with the fault dimensions, was what informed the shape map at the time, and also the loss estimations that we did. But if you look at the right, and you look at the distances over which this event was felt, magnitude 8.8, .8, you realize that you know, a Cascadia earthquake would be felt uh, not only where I am in Denver, but probably Chicago and further east. And this is about 400, sorry, 4,000 kilometers, uh, that black line there. So a Cascadia earthquake would be felt over most of the United States. Kind of hard to imagine, but just look at the area that's, that's shaken by this 8.8 earthquake. So that, like I said, we can put into the shake map as a constraint. And, and as we look and we get the data from the Chilean several months later, we can add the ground motion data to this particular earlier plot and see that it changes, um, but it only changes in, in, in rather, you know, in particular places significantly, but overall the story doesn't change all that much. And it's because we're pretty distant from the fault and the estimates are pretty reasonable and they're pretty consistent with what we would have from a prediction equation. So we can use that for loss estimates. And one of the important factors and an important consideration here in Seattle is that Santiago, the capital, which was, again, um, significantly above the interface and, and even north of the area that slipped, had particularly high shaking in, in part in mostly due to the fact that it is in a basin. And that's something that's going to come back to uh, for discussion purpose for, for Cascadia. But you can see that um, in the recordings. In, uh, in acceleration, it's not that impressive, but in velocity, you start to see the longer period component of the basin amplifying the seismic energy that's reaching there. Um, so in Santiago, there are a number of stations, not as many as we'd like, but we do see amplitudes that are, cons that are comparable to amplitudes at closer distances of the fault because of the basin amplifying the ground motions. So now we're looking at not a very shallow layer of uh, materials over rock, we're looking at a very deep basin that, that resonates and amplifies at longer periods. And that shows up pretty well in the prediction equations where things look really pretty good in acceleration. Santiago stations are all right here. In acceleration, the high frequencies don't really see this big basin. But if you look in velocity, you start to see the amplification at the longer periods. And that's where the basin effects are, are, are dominating. OK, moving on. Any questions about the Chilean earthquake? Um, Jim. Well, again, uh, it seems like there were uh, discrete asperities that hammered Constitución, and I, I, where are you measuring the dip? It seems like you can't really use a distance and ground motion prediction equation. People like to do that and say the equations are good, but the real earthquakes, if you're in the wrong place. Yeah, I, I know what you're struggling with, and I have the same problem. It, it, one of the saving graces here is that the interface is pretty deep, so the exact measurement along the slip area isn't as sensitive as if you were in a crustal earthquake like, like Christ Church. But it is an issue, and you know, if you really wanted to model those ground motions carefully, you would do so with the slip distribution in a model, a kinematic, a kinematic or dynamic model of earthquake rupture and propagate that out with the slip patterns that you have, and you'd be much better off than measuring it with a sing single distance measure. But always you're measuring to the closest part of the fault, even though a, an area of 20 kilometers over that's further may actually be the source of the strongest motion, strong motion at a particular site. So I, I agree, it's a, it's a simplification that, that's been around for a while, and it, and it, is, it, it is just that, it's a simplification. So um, Christchurch now we're, uh, in, in the Canterbury earthquake sequence, a magnitude 7 earthquake followed a couple months later by a magnitude 6.1 earthquake. As Jay mentioned, the magnitude 6.1 earthquake was the direct hit on uh, Christchurch. So that was the one that caused the fatalities and, and the greatest losses. But it was a series of earthquakes, clearly, uh, starting with the magnitude 7 earthquake, which in, in its own right um, did significant uh, damage, $2.5 billion worth of losses. And after the 6.1, it wasn't over. There was a 6 earthquake that also caused significant damage. It was close to Christchurch, but further offshore, as we'll see off here. Um, and then there were a number of other earthquakes that were, again, notable, but not as, as significant as the direct hit in February um, right beneath Christchurch. 
Uh, again, the, the New Zealanders were very keen in monitoring and had put out a number of strong motion instruments, even in this area of low hazard, so they recorded it quite nicely, probably considerably better than we recorded the Northridge earthquake, so that's some really important data. And in, in this particular case, we had a series of earthquakes where uh, particular sites experienced shaking levels above their design uh, multiple times, and that's something that's, that the engineering community is going to we'll, we'll hear about today. Um, and uh, as we'll hear from Ross, it, it's a, a severe uh, liquefaction in a case where you had multiple uh, events that reached the level of liquefaction, so that's an important aspect of the sequence of earthquakes as well. Uh, now this happened uh, in an area that's relatively low hazard compared to the dominant feature along uh, the central part of New Zealand, which is the Alpine Fault, the New Zealand equivalent of the San Andreas Fault. So this happened in an area where um, the return time for earthquakes was expected to be much greater, so uh, the, the code reflected that, and we'll hear about more, more about that today. And the sequence started with this magnitude 7 earthquake. This magnitude 7 earthquake was the only one of the sequence that had surface offset. It ruptured along a fairly large uh, length here, and it had multiple faults involved. So it was a pretty complicated rupture, uh, as you'll see in a second. And the way the sequence started was with that magnitude 7 earthquake, very complicated pattern aftershocks. It was just a vertical fault, a very simple earthquake. You probably have a very nice line of aftershocks. The aftershocks tend to align along the fault that ruptures, as well as you know, scattered beyond it. But in this case, the hypocenter was here, and there were a number of faults involved in the main shock, as well as the, the one that dominated the surface offset right here. And some of those aftershocks you know, went beyond the rupture dimension and started going all around, as they typically do for earthquakes. And this particular location here was what ultimately turned into the magnitude 6.1 earthquake that was the devastating one right beneath the city. So, you know, what, was this anticipated? I, I don't think so. Nobody knew about the fault beneath, nobody had mapped out the fault beneath Christ Church, so even if you suspected these aftershocks would, may lead to something else, you wouldn't know exactly how to model that because you don't have a fault to put it onto, the stress changes. And so, uh, again, this is something that we'll be looking at in great detail. Um, that particular six led to more aftershocks and more triggering that went offshore, and that was followed by a number of other offshore events. So it was a pretty complicated sequence. And um, clearly, you know, there's a direct relationship between the magnitude 6.1 and the magnitude 7 earthquake. It was off the end of the fault rupture for the main shock, so was it triggered, was it an aftershock? Those semantics, you know, are, are subtle and there is a continuum, but from an insurance policy, it's a, it's a very important uh, thing to answer um, because the clauses in, in insurance are very specific about the wording. From a shaking perspective, you know, we've got two significant earthquakes that were pretty well recorded in close, and this is very important. Uh, we, we make sure the faults here, something that we can learn from in, uh, in the western U.S. Uh, these recordings are showing that in the Christchurch area here for the main shock, there was significant shaking, but it was higher in the, in the after uh, the triggered event, the magnitude 6.1, and that's reflected in the intensities quite nicely. So that's the story in terms of the shaking, and we can analyze these observations in a lot more detail. Um, Brand Brendan Bradley has done so, and so I'm using some of his slides. This is the main shock, the Magic 7 earthquake. The, the faults involved are, fault, are modeled as four faults, so it's a very complicated rupture. Uh, the largest one here had the surface offset and radiated the energy towards Christ Church, as we'll see. So these are the horizontal motions. They reach three quarters of a G and over 1G vertically. Uh, peak velocity is about 115 centimeters per second, but we probably didn't record the largest uh, uh, ground motions along the fault. There's not that many stations in close. They might have been higher velocities than that in, in, in the near source area. If we look at the vertical components, they're also pretty impressive along the fault and, um, and significant in the uh, urban area, but not as strong as you'll see for the, for the magnitude 6 earthquake. One of the um, classic features that you see on crustal earthquakes is what we call directivity. The source started, ruptured up dip, and then outward towards Christchurch. And as, as you asked about these pulses and how they show up in Tokyo, in this case, 
the energy is focused in one direction, it arrives all at the same time because of the velocity of the rupture is close to the shear velocity, you get this large pulse, and this large pulse shows up just about everywhere in, in ground velocity as you look across stations in, um, in the Christ Church area. So these are some of the urban stations, and they all show this pulse of velocity that's an indication of rupture coming towards those stations. So that feature is a significant one in controlling the ground motions for that main shot. There's another effect that becomes pretty clear when you look at the seismograms in detail. There's uh, a deeper basin as you go towards Christ Church, and uh, Brendan Bradley is ex examining the, uh, the seismograms, trying to look for that basin effect. And effectively, a basin can resonate these uh, ground motions and, and add to the duration. And you see that in a number of sites where this initial P wave is here, the velocity pulse that we saw from the source uh, the directivity pulse is coming towards that particular station, and then that reverberates long periods um, due to being trapped in the velocity uh, layer that, uh, that's above rock in this basin in Christchurch. Now, the really interesting thing about these um, ground motions for the Christchurch earthquake is vertical motions are extremely high. You're right above the source, and, and that's part of the reason, but there's also a lot of site amplification going on, as we'll see. And we'll look at these two particular stations uh, where the vertical components are really, really impressive. So much higher ground motions than during the magnitude 7 earthquake, again, because the proximity of these sites to the fault. And the fault, in this case, is buried. It does not reach the surface, but it is beneath the city right here. In, in uh, horizontal components, the, the motions are also very significant. Uh, we'll examine some of these in detail, but you can see right away that some of these are truncated. Uh, these stations we'll talk about in Rossville as well. Liquefaction is going on here, so you lose the high frequencies right away uh, as soon as the liquefaction occurs. Uh, and those are fairly impressive uh, motions until that happens. Um, and one thing we can do, like we can do in Japan, is to examine the difference between rock and soil stations. In this case, we don't have the luxury of having downhole stations, but we can look at two sites that are pretty close to each other, pretty comparable distance to the fault, no matter how you measure it. And, uh, um, you can pretty much say that the difference between these two sites is attributed primarily to the conditions of, the, of this uh, geology that they're on. And the one on the right is effectively rock. The one on the left is a soil uh, site. And so we can examine the seismograms from these. And the rock site is on top. The soil site is on, on the bottom in blue. And uh, what we find is that the soil site is losing high frequencies, but it's amplifying long periods. Uh, and that's, that's a very important feature in the soil amplification. And on the vertical component, actually things don't look all that different. The energy is propagating through vertically and not, not seeing the, the soil column uh, as much. And if you look at that in terms of the uh, spectral response, it's something that we see consistently. Um, the ver the, uh, this is a horizontal component on rock, with very, very high frequencies that are diminished on the soil and pushed out to longer periods. Um, and so the longer period motion here is the soil amplification at the expense of the higher frequencies, which are greater attenuated in that soil column. Um, the vertical components, again, they don't see that. There's dominant type of P waves and there are large vertical components, uh, both on soil and on rock. What's really interesting about some of these Christ Church records is I showed you those two really large accelerations in the vertical component. Prior to this earthquake, uh, a colleague, Shin Aoi at, at, uh, at Need, which runs the, the research seismic network in, uh, in Japan, had written a paper that he talked about the trampoline effect. He had seen many recordings prior to the, the Christchurch, this was published before the Christchurch earthquake, where he had a lot of records where the vertical component on the up direction was larger than the vertical component on the down direction. And he noticed that. Uh, and explained it with what he called the trampoline effect, where uh, if you think about a trampoline, you can go up a lot further than you can come down because you have the bound, bounding layer or the earth to keep you from going below 1G. And what happens if you look at these records and you draw 1G on there, you realize that that's exactly what's happening. And what he explains this, uh, by is a layer effectively of soil that is effectively airborne as you go above 1G in the vertical direction. And then uh, you see that in the up direction and down direction, you're only going down 1G. So that's pretty remarkable. And I, when I first read that paper, I was pretty skeptical. 
I saw only a couple recordings, but then since then we've seen many of these recordings, and it's a pretty clear observation um, that, that's coming through consistently. So that does result in, in um, vertical to horizontal ratios that are significantly uh, larger than uh, than you might expect. And, you know, the two thirds ratio that's typically used uh, certainly holds up for distances greater than about five or ten kilometers. But some of these close-in stations, particularly for the um, for the February event in Christchurch, where the source was right beneath the uh, the station, you have vertical to horizontal ratios that are much higher. And uh, for the most part, this is happening at stations that, that show liquefaction. Again, we'll hear more about the liquefaction, but uh, there's where you have vertical components carrying through the large amplitudes and the horizontal components being knocked out. So the ratio goes up very, very high. Um, skip over this. The, uh, the important thing, well, let's go back. The, one of the interesting things with all these earthquakes is that the ground motion prediction equations, even with this uncertain distance measure, do on average capture the essence of the shaking in both peak acceleration and peak velocity, with the outliers being culprits that are fairly well explained by either these directivity pulses, by the site amplification that we see in Japan and others. In this case, you, you can explain the outliers quite nicely with, the, with a better knowledge of the site conditions than just simply VS-30. And the long period pulse that you see on a number of these records is dominated by this directivity pulse for the um, for the larger earthquake, the magnitude 7 earthquake, that pulse is, is, is not as dominant for the smaller earthquake. You don't have that level, level of directivity, but you do have the basin effect as well as liquefaction. So you see this large pulse at, at a couple seconds. It's pretty important, um, again, as primarily uh, a source combined with a basin and, and site effect all, all thrown in together. And if you compare these records, the Tohoku records, even at very, very high acceleration, are dominated by very high frequencies. As you look at the Tohoku record and you go down to close to two, two hertz or one second, you're well below what you see in Christchurch and much lower than what you saw in the Kobe earthquake. And if you kind of zoom in on the scale, it amplifies that, that difference quite nicely. And you see that uh, you know, the lack of, of one second energy is really consistent with the lack of significant damage in, in, in uh, much of Tohoku, even though the accelerations were extremely large. Um, let me skip this slide. The, the interesting thing about a number of these earthquakes, and I'm going to close them just in a minute here, um, is that there's a significant amount of triggering going on here. We have you know, this magnitude 6 earthquake as a, a clear um, triggered event from magnitude 7 earthquake. Uh, what you probably don't know about, because there's so much going on after the Japanese earthquake, was the fact that there was increased seismicity all over Japan, and a lot of it in volcanic areas, but also in other parts of the crust. So there was damage caused by earthquakes in, uh, in three different places, and um, one particular event was a magnitude 6.6 .6 normal faulting earthquake that occurred right here, but there were three magnitude 6 earthquakes, each of which, which were damaging, one of them right here, was right beneath, oh, let me go back. It was right beneath um, Mount Fuji. It was only five kilometers from the uh, from the um, summit of Mount Fuji. So you know we had this magnitude nine earthquake. We have the tsunami. We've got the nuclear fallout going on, and we see this magnitude six earthquake at Fuji, and we just said no. We, <laughs> we uh, you know you think back to Darwin and you say okay this happens occasionally. It doesn't happen all the time for subduction zone earthquakes, but the last time Fuji erupted was in 1707, one month and a half after the last major subduction earthquake near Mount Fuji. So at NEIC, we we're a bit nervous about that, and we just couldn't imagine that on top of all of what's happened, that we have an eruption of Mount Fuji. But again, it doesn't happen that often. There's a lot more subduction earthquakes than there are triggered um, volcanic eruptions. And so we dodged a bullet with that one, uh, although obviously the, the, the disaster was enough on its own. But what's really interesting to me is that this magnitude 6.6 .6 normal faulting earthquake happened in the crust, um, and it was the best recorded normal faulting earthquake in history. <laughs> and it's just buried in this huge magnitude 9 earthquake, and all the data is coming out of it. But people like John Anderson and others that are worried about uh, normal faulting earthquakes in Reno and in the Salt Lake region and other parts of the country, this is a huge data set and it's a very important one to, to be testing our prediction equations against and our understanding of normal faulting ruptures. Um, and I do want to point out that the main shock for, for Tohoku itself was a, a triggered event. It was a 
certainly preceded two days by a very significant foreshock, magnitude 7.3, um, at about the same location that the ultimate main shock occurred. So the foreshocks are right here, the main shock is right here, two days before. The magnitude 7.3 had its own magnitude 6 aftershock, a couple magnitude 6 earthquakes. And so, um, again, that ultimately turns into a foreshock, but there's lots of magnitude 7s occurring off Japan all the time, and not all of them lead to magnitude 9 earthquakes. So, um, you know, in hindsight, that's pretty obvious foreshock, but in, uh, at the time of the earthquake, it was just another of many, many like it. Uh, okay, so then, you know, you go back to this picture of the shape maps, and you see these things in, in scale, and you realize that a lot of the dominant information here is about the distance to the source and what kind of uh, radiation you're getting from the, uh, the interface. And having urban areas, even though you have much smaller earthquakes, direct hits can be really disastrous. Um, uh, although, obviously, here with the huge slips that you had offshore, you have uh, a significant tsunami generation. But I think now we've kind of gone back and explained most of the details that you see here. And uh, a lot of them are attributed to source, a lot of them are attributed to uh, site conditions, and, and I think sort of put together that picture with this really rich data set. And um, I just want to close with a couple slides on what the implications may be for us. In the Pacific Northwest right now, um, we had done a scenario where we looked at the rupture dimension for the Cascadia event. Coming up with a magnitude 9 earthquake is, is quite straightforward with the dimension here. Um, one of the challenges uh, is understanding how far down dip, the interface should be locked. It's not as far as we see it beneath uh, Japan and Chile. And so we think that the extent of rupture may be close to the coast or, or, or just slightly inland. And that's very different than Chile and Japan where the, the actual radiation occurs beneath the land and further inland than you have for, for the um, uh, Cascadia subduction zone. So for the large cities in Chile, we had about a 60 kilometer distance vertically from the, um, from the interface. And if we look at cities like Seattle and Portland, we're about 50 kilometers above the interface. Yet, we don't think the rupture will be beneath uh, us here, but would rather be to the west. And exactly where is to be determined, that's a hard thing to resolve. Um, but we think it would be significantly larger distances than 50 kilometers than, than uh, just the vertical dimension to, to the plate boundary. So that's just something to keep in mind. But keep in mind also that we have very significant basin effects in that uh, Santiago region from the Chilean earthquake. We could imagine some very significant basin effects from Seattle in particular, and perhaps from Portland and other basins in the area. So just some things to keep in mind we can talk about later. So I'll just wrap up and say that this is you know, a very complicated picture for Tohoku. Um, we know about the deep slip being the radiator of high frequencies, the shallow slip generating the largest slips and the largest tsunami uh, source. Um, some other things that are important is that that 500 year history that we had for Tohoku, looking at the segmentation and the earthquakes that happened historically, was not enough time. And so uh, going back in time is really key. The, the other thing is that magnitude 9 earthquakes can occur in relatively small areas, apparently. And so we have to really rethink which subduction zones around the world can carry much larger earthquakes if the slip on them is on average much larger than, than we've seen in the past. And um, as I mentioned a number of times, the PGAs can be a bit misleading in terms of what actually happens in shaking and damage. The PGVs are a little bit more consistent with what we see uh, in terms of shaking damage. Um, and they're pretty well modeled by the ground motion prediction equations. Side effects were really quite remarkable and very well captured. And so we can examine this quite nicely. And um, and keep in mind that that 50 meters of slip was not a factor for the strong motion generation. It was well offshore and it happened very slowly, but it was the dominant factor for the tsunami generation. Um, and then just finally consider the, the implication of these triggered earthquakes. The triggered earthquakes in some cases can be the, the worst culprits if they are shaking an area that harder than during the main shock. And that's certainly the case of Christchurch. And I will close with one complicated equation just to wrap the whole thing up. And that's data equals good. And uh, I'll get through a talk with one equation. And I really think it's a story here. We can talk about these earthquakes a long time because of the data collection was so rich and so, so, uh, so uh, widely made available. Thanks. Any other questions? <laughs>
Yeah, so with the subduction interface event, typically you have a, a cleaner surface than you do for crustal earthquakes. You know, some, some crustal earthquake faults like San Andreas are very clean in some places and simple, and you get, for Parkfield for instance, you get all of the aftershocks right on the San Andreas fault. Quite remarkable. You get some triggered earthquakes off the fault, but very few. A uh, crustal earthquake like New Zealand, the main shock was on a number of different faults. And so the stress patterns and the stress changes and the faults involved can be more than just these four. It could be a number of different splays. You see a volume of aftershocks. Uh, and in each case, you have aftershocks and triggered events that are off the causative fault. The dominant source of you know, restress, restressing and restress distribution is on the fault where it slipped. But it's also generates stress changes around it. That volume may or may not have aftershocks depending on what state it is in in terms of its failure, what kind of faults are around. So you see a whole range of behaviors. Um, in the case of Tohoku, most of the aftershocks were simple thrust aftershocks right on the interface. A lot of them at the depth they'd expect right for that interface. And then you have these crustal vents all throughout Japan and volcanic areas. And the, triggering nature of those, and, and Joan Gomberg sitting next to you there is, is really an expert on this, and a lot of that's just stress redistribution, and some of it's due to the seismic waves generated by the main shock going through volcanic areas and shaking it up like a, a soda bottle. So, the, the, and the combination that's pretty complicated, and the available faults that are there for uh, being triggered is very complicated, and in most cases unknown. So. You, know, you get a, a whole variety of, of behaviors, and I think we've seen that variety here quite, quite nicely. Um, uh, the typical case for a very simple rupture, though, is to have off-end stress you know, accumulation. So for that Christchurch earthquake, having the 6.1 off the end is not all that inconsistent with what the, you know, the stress change models would show. Um, but the story is always more complicated. And the fact that we didn't know that that fault was there means you wouldn't know what stress to put, what orientation to put that stress on. And it could actually have taken things away from failure rather than towards failure if the fault of geometry was different. So it's a complicated story, but it's a, a very important one. Joan, go ahead. Within days following the 8.8, it leveled a city and caused several fatalities. So this happens pretty much everywhere, following these kinds of events. That's a good point. Uh, yes, the question about this hydraulic fraction for petroleum, I have a I guess that petroleum extraction has triggered events for a long time, probably minor, but uh, we have a benefit of having you here any comment about what that activity might do on the East Coast? Is it even a good thing that it's releasing stresses? Let's let's probably save that for this afternoon. It's a great question. You know, in a nutshell, it's not fr the fracking; it's the, uh, the wastewater injection at depth, and that um, that's been happening throughout the decades. We've seen it. There's just a lot more activity going on, so we're, we're much more keen to 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 these events. But let, let's cover that when we get a, a panel discussion going on this afternoon. Good question. Have you observed damage due to a vertical acceleration at Christchurch? The vertical accelerations? Um, I'll leave that for the uh, later talks this afternoon on engineering. Um, <laughs> let's leave it at that. Yeah, there's, it, it's hard to separate the strong horizontal motions and the com contribution of the vertical accelerations. And if you're looking at damage, it, it's very difficult in a forensic approach to, to see the direct impact of vertical acceleration. So that's a bit of a challenge. 
Um, it'd be nice if you had a situation where you had only vertical motions and you could see damage, but they're never separate from the, the horizontal contribution. So uh, I think we'll hear more about that uh, this afternoon. Any other questions? Yeah, so the, the, in light of what's happened in Italy in terms of the convictions of seismologists there for, for apparently poor communication, um, and what we've learned from these recent earthquakes, am I going to change my strategies, uh, or should we change our strategies in terms of communications, to, to expand your question a little? Um, you know, I, I think there were lessons that were available prior to these earthquakes that, that should follow through. The convictions uh, for failing to communicate tells me that there was a real lack of describing the problem, and the problem is that there are really weak structures here, and these structures will cause loss of life and very expensive losses in any earthquake in Italy that's significant. Um, that story is very different in Christchurch in um, Chile and in Tohoku, where the engineering is actually quite good. What happened in Christchurch, if happened in an Italian city with a similar population, would be horrendous. So um, I think, you know, as long as we continue to communicate the fact that the risks are due to, due to inadequacies of structures in particular places, um, we're, we're okay. As we go to start saying when and how strong and uh, looking at probabilities, then we really need to rethink the way we communicate because people are listening and people are, are making decisions based on those and probabilities are very hard to communicate. Uh, I do, I, it's a good question because we now communicate rapidly after an earthquake our estimates of fatalities in terms of ranges of fatalities and estimates of economic losses. I was always concerned about doing that but we couch it in a very uh, very simple form of uncertainty, which actually encompasses the entire possibilities. So effectively, we can't be wrong. We can be more accurate, um, you know, if we if we come in the right alert level. And um, it, it, it's an important consideration because we are putting out information that people are using for decision making. And so, um, uh, your question is a very good one in that we don't spend as much time in understanding our communication skills as we understand the science. And I think we really need to put a lot more effort into that. So you talked about the, the issues that Tohoku raised with understanding the fault segmentation, or predicting or estimating the fault segmentation. Does that, does that just apply to the subduction zones? Well, well, yeah, it's not just the subduction zones. It's the fault segmentation that we're talking about. It probably has. Um, worse news for, for anywhere else because in the subduction zone you have really high rates of occurrence. So you can, you can witness um, recurrence times that are short and see many, many episodes. In 400 years there were a lot of earthquakes. In only a few places when you get on land can you actually go back in time like you can in certain places on the San Andreas or the Hayward Fault and get a sense of what looks to be repeatable and what's c close to being characteristic in any way. Um, in most places, uh, we, we don't have that luxury. So I think it does, you know, raise a red flag in terms of the notion of repeatability and characteristic and understanding segmentation to the point where we can take little pieces of the fault and give them probabilities. And so that, that's going to be something that, that it's a long-term endeavor that may or may not improve with, with more information. It could be fundamentally um, unpredictable in terms of how faults are, are uh, segmented. 